So in this short video we're going to talk about what epigenetics and histone modifications are. So what is epigenetics? So a traditional definition is meiotically and mitotically heritable changes in gene expression that are not coded in the sequence itself. An alternative much broader view is to say the structural adaptation of chromosomal regions so as to register, signal or perpetuate altered activity states. That was Adrian Bird in 20, 2007. And another way of putting it is to say all phenomena or mechanisms that impact upon DNA function. That was Adele Merle. And so really what scientists are saying is, well, yes, the original definition refers to heritable changes, but actually a lot of what we refer to as epigenetics today we haven't definitely shown that it's always mitotically heritable or and certainly not always meiotically heritable. Um, and so really as a working definition, anything to do with uh, histone modifications, chromatin remodelling, um, tends to be called epigenetics. And so really going with what Adele Merle said, uh, anything that impacts upon DNA function that is not actually changes in the DNA sequence itself. So typical sorts of epigenetic regulators include histone modifications, DNA methylation and long non-coding RNA. And these can work together to either make silencing, and we know silencing can be heritable, we just don't know whether it always is inherited during mitosis, and also to activate gene expression. So looking again at this uh, nucleosomal structure and the tails of those histones protruding out from the nucleosome. So this is the end terminal tail of histone H3. So they all have modifications, but we're focusing on H3 to narrow it down to some that are easy to remember. So as you know, lysine residues are written with the letter K. So we can see there's several lysine residues in the H3 tail, um, and also several arginine residues shown by this green R. Now both lysine and arginine are positively charged. And so you can see now, why the histone tail is positively charged um, and we know that these tails can interact with the negatively charged linker DNA um, and help to compact it. So both lysines and arginines can be modified and also we have a couple of serines here in purple serines um, and they, they can also be modified. So there's many sites even on just one end terminal tail that can be post-translationally modified. And there are several types of modification. This isn't all of them. We can have acetylation on lysines, phosphorylation on serines, methylation on lysines and arginines. And you can see um, this is not even a complete picture. There's lots of them. We also have a ubiquitylation mark as well. So we're going to look first of all at acetylation. So as I said, this happens on lysine residues and it involves a histone acetyl transferase. So this is a family, there's many types of hats which can acetylate different lysines and they use acetyl coenzyme A to take the acetyl group and stick it on the end of the lysine residue. Uh, this now neutralises the positive charge um, and so the histone tail doesn't interact with the linker DNA quite so well and this contributes to chromatin unfolding but it also forms a new binding platform for proteins that bind to acetyl lysine, as I'll come on to. So acetylation can be added by histone acetyl transferases, and it is removed by a family of enzymes called histone deacetylases, or HDACs. These HDACs can be inhibited by several different compounds and drugs. So in the lab, we can use trichostatin A or sodium butyrate, but also there's many HDAC inhibitors that are used um, in the clinic, uh, used in cancer treatment or schizophrenia, schizophrenia treatment. And so treatment of cells with any of these HDAC inhibitors will shift the equilibrium so we have more acetylation in the cell and acetylation is typically associated with active transcription. So HAT complexes or histone acetyl transferase complexes 
are recruited by transcription factors. They don't have sequence specific DNA binding activity, so they don't know where to go within the genome. So they have to be recruited by transcription factors. And so here we have an example. The UAS just means upstream activating sequence. GCN4 is a protein that has a DNA binding domain and an activation domain, which has recruited this complex, which contains a hat called GCN5. And GCN5 has acetylated the nucleosomes in the vicinity of this transcription factor binding site. Examples of hats that you might come across when you're reading reviews or papers are GCN5, PCAF and P300 slash CBP, which are two very, very similar proteins. So if you come across these names, that's what they are, they're hats. Equally, histone deacetylases have to be recruited. They're recruited by repressive transcription factors. So here we have, again, this is examples from use an upstream repressor sequence bound by a DNA binding protein with a repressor domain. It's recruited this complex, which has SYN3A and a histone deacetylase. And so it's deacetylated the nucleosomes in the vicinity of this repressor binding site. Okay, so what happens when a lysine has been acetylated? Well, then it recruits proteins, proteins that specifically have something called a bromodomain. So here we have some bromodomain com containing proteins binding to acetyl lag lysine. The sorts of proteins that have bromodomains, again, are more hats, there's sort of positive feedback there, and also remodeling complexes like uh, the switch sniff uh, remodeling complex. So once the acetyl lysine has recruited a bromodomain com containing protein, these tend to be co-activators. And so these will promote the binding of other transcription factors and the mediator complex, uh, stabilizing the recruitment of RNA polymerase II and stabilizing the formation of the pre-initiation complex. Um, and as you know, this should then promote the initiation of transcription. So the idea is that you have um, active mark recruiting proteins that help to stabilize this pre-initiation complex and stimulate transcription. And you may know that transcription initiation is caused by phosphorylation of particular sites in the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase. And when this phosphorylation occurs, that allows the release of the polymerase, it starts transcribing and leaves all the transcription factors behind at the promoter. So we can classify some of these epigenetic factors into writers, readers and erasers. So a writer is something like a hat, a histone acyl transferase that puts on a histone modification. So GCN5 is an example of a writer because it adds an acetyl group. A reader is a protein that binds to a modified histone. So something that contains a bromodomain that binds us to lysine, for example, CVP, um, is known as a reader. And then erasers are the enzymes that remove those modifications, so the histone deacetylases, for example. And using this terminology of writer, reader and eraser might help you to get your head around it because I know there's lots of names here and you maybe don't want to remember all of them, but this can help you to classify them. The other modification I want to talk about is lysine methylation. So again, there's a family of enzymes um, known collectively as histone methyl transferases or HMTs. They use s methionine to take a methyl group and add it to the end of the lysine residue. Now, because of the chemistry, we can have one, two or three methyl groups added to this lysine. And structurally, you can see these are a bit different. So proteins that bind to monomethyl lysine might not recognise trimethyl lysine and vice versa. So there's an added complexity based on how many methyl groups there are here. And there's different enzymes that can add the, the mono, di or trimethyl. And equally, there are enzymes that remove methyl groups, although for a long time we couldn't find any histone demethylases. And so we thought, oh, this is, the, this is really epigenetic. Once you've added a methyl to a lysine group, it's stuck there, you can't get it off. But actually, they were just not using the right sorts of cofactors in their experiments. 
And so now uh, there's a whole family of histone demethylases which can remove these methyl groups back to unmethylated lysine. So I said before that acetylation is, tends to be an active mark. So lysine methylation is more complex and can be associated with either activation or repression depending on which lysine has been modified. So on this H3 tail, um, methylation of lysine 4 is strongly associated with transcription activation. You find it at active promoters. There's another couple of methyl lysines a bit further within the core domain, which are also associated with transcription activation. But then these two lysines here, lysine 9, lysine 27, when they're methylated, they are related to transcription repression. So there's not many uh, marks I need you to remember, but these are the key ones, lysine 4, lysine 9, and lysine 27 of histone H3. So thinking specifically of that lysine 4 methylation, just to show you examples of some of the writers, readers and erasers, there are others out there, um, but MLL is one that, can, that is a writer that will methylate lysine 4 of histone H3. It contains a set domain, a set domain is the catalytic domain that does the methylation. And then we have something called Jared 1, which is the demethylase. And MLL is often upregulated in cancer or mutated so that it's more active in cancer. Methyl lysine 4 can be bound by a protein called CHD1. It has a chromo domain that binds methyl lysine. So if you remember, bromo domains bind acetyl lysine, but chromo domains bind methyl lysine. And CHD1 happens to be a remodeling complex that's associated with the transcription. But it's not the only thing that will bind to methyl ly methylated lysine for. Okay, so at the end of this section, I've just got another wee multiple choice question for you to think about.